morning, Claudia, from Washington, D.C., not Washington on the West Coast, because then we would be in the middle of a forest fire, right? Something like that, a flood, something, no water, whatever it is. So good morning, welcome. Good morning to you, Ken. It's been a pleasure to be here again on uh, uh, Bide Nexus with you. Well, we never, we tried to meet up in Washington. We we're supposed to go for dinner and then things, everything got out of, got a whack. So at some point in time, I have to go to Washington and we'll connect. And you can take oh, the Smithsonian so I can see where I took my first flight on the Wright Brothers plane. Okay, okay. so this is a continuation of the talk that you did uh, on Zoom to Kia. Too bad you weren't there. Beautiful setting, was lovely, but you were part of the, uh, what was it? Sort of like the, they introduced people from the DDS and various organizations and you were part of it online. And the focus of your conversation was global opportunities for women in leadership, okay? That was very much the context of it. That being said, the point of this conversation is a continuum. You've got a lot of interesting adventures coming up, journals, which we'll talk about. But for the most part, what you did is you sent me a, an incomplete CV. So your incomplete CV from, one, from 1999 to now, including COVID, was a, over 30 positions, and that was incomplete. So two questions, Claudia. Number one. Your executive function skills must be off the charts. That's not really a question, it's a statement. But the second question of greatest importance is, do you ever sleep? Like, do you actually ever put your head down in a pillow and get eight hours of rest so that you have work-life balance? Does that ever happen for you? So, uh, great questions. Thank you again for the very direct uh, inquisition. And I like yeah. that uh, because I like to, that's, that's uh, in the same wavelength as I uh, transact. Um, yes, I do sleep and I sleep actually, I, I need a very significant amount of time to okay. sleep. But when I do awake, I essentially awake at a very high level of energy and without much notice uh, drops. But uh, uh, that said, um, yes, it was a welcoming ceremony um, that Dr. the organizer, Dr. Nikolai, had uh, uh, very graciously included me, of course, along with the president of the FBI, who's also, uh, as we know, um, a leading woman in dentistry globally. And the message was a global um, sense of uh, opportunities and encouragement for women uh, to partake in leadership and contribute effectively and efficiently in the dental profession. And that went, of course, very much in sync with, uh, with the mis message at the, um, uh, at the Sardinia meeting um, just, that just occurred. Um, so that said, um, the reference that you made to the CV, the incomplete list is just a board positions appointment. It is not an exhaustive list, of course, um, but it's just a representation. 30, 30 of them, like that's an incomplete list, 30, okay? 20 years, 30 positions, probably 40. That's okay, that's kind of interesting. Well, it's a lot of lessons, a lot of opportunities, a lot of lessons, a lot of hurdles. I'm and sure. if you, I would say that if I would uh, have a choice in terms of how I would engage in um, exercise, mental or otherwise, mm -hmm. I would rather engage in a real territory opportunity. Uh, sometimes it's better to have it, of course, among uh, uh, individuals who will care for you and who support you, but inevitably the real world is always waiting and that's really where you get to uh, be tested. So um, that I think it's important to keep in mind. Okay, so I was gonna suggest that given how sort of forceful you are and so um, your leadership skills are so crucial, you should take up rugby. Like rugby would be very appropriate. So I'm gonna ask you a bunch of questions. And um, I mean, I'm not very much of an organizational person at all, but too chaotic. But the, the talking points that we're gonna address in terms of your perspective on how women can assume leadership roles in important areas, not just dentistry, but mm -hmm. corporate, organizational, nonprofit, for profit. It all ties into your, you went to UM, University of Michigan, and you got multiple masters, toxicology. So, the first question What do great boards do to allow women to be impactful, corporate, organizational, nonprofit, for profit, et cetera? What do they allow you? What is the, the structure allow you as a woman to do? Is there, Certainly. 
Is there a difference between being a man, being a woman? But what does it allow you to do in those roles? Yes, of course. So my my position is that um, a leader, if if this is you know what we are called to do, and we are leaders, even in a very very small opportunity of uh, impact as a uh, between a doctor and patient um, interaction uh, that takes leadership to to execute, even in on a small uh, radius, if you will. But uh, for those individuals who feel the calling uh, to contribute more extensively in their immediate locale, geo position, also across the globe, of course, um, the proliferation of interest should be almost a 360 view from a 360 healthcare component. And this is the reason I would say why I came to Washington or what brought me to Washington, because opportunities were put before me. And um, yes, I had uh, the uh, training, academic training that incorporated an oral systemic model of course, brought me very close to uh, other to all the participants that transact in the healthcare commodity space, from legal to uh, business to um, uh, industry, uh, media, consumer platforms, and so um, you know the, the the doors open, and I stepped forward and I contributed in real time, and that is what essentially um, rendered a very active participation with a certain amount of reward a lot of, as I said, hurdles and a lot of sometimes stressful situations or unpredictable situations, but it was good practice. It was good practice to mature. It was good practice to exercise the engagement with different personalities, even though the goals are very much the same professionally. And the manageability of that opportunity, uh, de novo, I would say, oftentimes um, gives more of an energy influx, right? Uh, sometimes when uh, we want to flex a muscle, the cyclical discipline program no longer sort of you know kicks in as expected so we have to transition to a different a different interaction potential and so when um, my recommendation and um, by virtue of where i was brought in and a lot of my activities transacted in the 360 healthcare commodity space from the very beginning um, as i was invited to do uh, policy uh, here in washington dc with the american dental association back in 2000 and one, um, my recommendation is to um, give ample thought to invitations, professional invitations, worthy invitations, even though the experience is not there. But the skill set and the talent and the instinct, if you will, or the calling, uh, is 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 obviously present, and and there's a there's an affinity vector toward it. That said how do great boards allow women to be impactful on the boards they let them run they don't Good. control them they don't pull them back they allow them the flexibility and the creativity and i have to say that um, the action reaction is really what measures the capacity and the quality of the board so it's always fun to talk to you because i always have to go back to a dictionary and try and understand what you just said to me it's very very interesting and we got to call it D.C., Washington, D.C. It's D.C. Let's call it what it is. OK, so hang on. I got to look up geoposition and that's like, OK. All right. So here's the next question. What do bad boards do to stifle women to have limited impact on these boards? Again, corporate, organizational, nonprofit, for profit. So you just said that it's very positive. It's engaging. They energize it. They basically I got a word for you. They actionalize. Right. Is that the word? Operationalize. Sorry, not act. Operationalize what you're doing. Okay, so what do bad boards do to stop you? Like when you join a board, and if you kind of walk in and you can see they're already misogynistic, the whole nine yards, what do you do? How do you deal with that? Well, I actually am always myself. So I come very focused, uh, professional, generous, and um, I don't like to waste my time. So I like to really engage to see exactly what the potential is. Um, there is a time limit component, and I can come back a little bit later on this um, in our conversation, in terms of how much allowance should one give in a scenario. Um, but um, essentially, uh, bad boards essentially try to control their members, including women, or they try to preferentially uh, uh, exercise favoritism 
um, either because they have an agenda that uh, either has been, uh, you know, present for for uh, longitudinal time and it needs to be exercised. But the reality, a mature perspective, will know that agendas exist. Everybody has agendas. I have an agenda. You have an agenda. Everybody has agendas. The difference, however, is that the transparency, the professionalism, the fairness, the generosity, and also the capability and skill set, I would say comes to the surface right away. And when that is av available and is legible, uh, then of course the temptation is for egos to compete, etc. In my opinion, I don't think egos or any type of pride has any, at any place in a leadership um, um, propensity or opportunity. So when I see that present it gives me a, a, obviously a red flag. There's ways to, to, to mitigate that. And sometimes I've done incredible things, you know, in the presence of complete, uh, you know, 99% obstacles and I'm the, uh, you know, the, the, the exception. And you've been, I'm sure, in the same situation many times with uh, very used to run away points. from it. I just call it quits. I'm done. <laughs> Out the door. Well, there comes a point, well, yes, maturity calls for evaluation and self-assessment. Um, there's always a win-win, but if, there, if there's lack of reasonable um, um, commitment to, number one, integrity, then certain variables, I would say, are necessary to be identifiable right away so that uh, the contribution is essential. Uh, many times, as I said, um, I don't like to burn bridges, uh, but sometimes it just has to come to an end. Um, mm -hmm. Even in those situations, years later, um, it does, you know, um, there's a cycle and of, of, of great feedback that I didn't hear at the time. The impact is there, yeah. uh, you know, and um, whatever seed or seed I leave behind, you know, I really leave it up to God and I've done my job and uh, people do pick up. And sometimes it's a matter of, um, you know, being a catalyst. And so uh, I have uh, three C's in my name. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to play catalytic activities at times. And I don't have to get the, you know, the, uh, the credit. I know exactly what I'm made of and what my purpose is. So that's uh, um, sufficient for me to know where I have done well, given the repertoire of my talents. And I think this is what we are really all called for. So before I move on to number three, you just made an interesting uh, comment. Uh, ego bashing at this level is an inevitability. So if I were a young person, never mind woman, um, what, what's what's the win for me in sticking around if I have to spend my limited time in coping on that level? What 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 structure drives you to do that? I mean, you're on a zillion boards. I, I can't imagine. I mean, the few that I have to imagine in many of these cases, it's like instead of taking the beach in Normandy on D-Day, you capture little grains of sand along the way because everybody has to have an opinion, of course. What drives you? Like, forget all this stuff. Just at your core, what makes you put up with what I'm sure is a lot of nonsense in these meetings? Like, things don't move. This one challenges this one. It just becomes a bit of a like this. What's at your core? You're, you're, you're in your soul. What drives you to do all this? It's an investment. So we all have been given talent and I don't want my talent to ever sit and not be used. So if I know that a particular board would have the availability, the opportunity and ask for me to contribute, in spite of the hurdles, in spite of the personality differentiation, in spite of the egos, etc., cetera, um, I find that being direct, being transparent and being very focused is absolutely essential and also gives me an opportunity to uh, self-discipline, self-control, self-test. At the same time, it gives me an opportunity to really exercise real world impact. Um, you know, if I were to start, for instance, Venture X, right, I would have an opportunity to exercise the same approach to execution when I work uh, with various different personalities from various different trifectas. Um, and I, uh, uh, you know, part of the, the uh, part of any issue or, or any situation is theoretical, but the other part equal to it is the actual practical journey of impact and real time impact. And that's really, I think, essential. So, um, well, you just said it time sensitive. Um, okay. Let's assume, I don't know how to phrase this without sounding inappropriate. Um, family. 
I have, I'm young, uh, I have a family, uh, I want to devote time to my children's activities, etc. How do you balance all this? I, if, I don't know, I don't think you have kids, but if you did, and you obviously work with people that do, how do you balance all this without, you just do. You just do. You just do. Okay. You just do. Basically, the opportunity is there. The, the the creativity component kicks in. It's a matter of what 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 your your what I made of and what I want to and how much of what I made of I want to make accessible um, to the environment. Okay. Either the people who I love and who I interact with, but also people who are in the expensive public domain. And so, as a clinician. I want to impact patients. I can do that directly, one-on-one, -on -one, or I can do that indirectly. And I can do it through a media segment. I can do it through a board extension. I can do it through a congressional hearing. I can do it through a regulatory uh, contribution in a standard. There are ample opportunities where I can impact a patient's um, information, access to evaluate the logic of the information so that they can actually make more informed decisions. Okay, so you're going to mentor me. <clears throat> My name is um, Angela. Okay, I just graduated from wherever. We're going to sit down. You're going to talk to me about what's, well, not driven you, but what has been the core of your life pursuits. What are you going to tell me? I'm just starting out. I'm in debt. I've got, you know, maybe I'm married or not married or whatever. I don't have kids. I do have kids. How are you going to encourage me to pick up the threads? Have a talk with me as if I were a young person graduating. I'm tired. I just went through dental school. I'm burned out to a certain degree. I just want to go to work, make some money, um, you know, get my life in order. Talk to me. Well, that's a difference. Exactly that. You know, uh, you have to find out and I would have to find out. And I, I'm uh, very definitive in terms of what my goals and uh, my talents are. And um, for the case scenario that you just gave, uh, the important is to figure out what it is that that individual wants. If they want to make money, then that's their calling. If they, you know, at any at any cost. And um, but I'm of the opinion that the the ends don't justify the means. Okay. For me, yes, it is wonderful to have beautiful things, to have valuable things. I appreciate very much function and beauty and mm -hmm. and, and sophistication. But equally, I appreciate uh, the integrity of the, uh, of the component of the contribution, um, and I will not compromise it. And so I think that realizing and addressing with accuracy what the individual is made of and what it is that they want. And there's no forcing component to say, you must do this. It has to come really from within. It's not just the heart. Oftentimes it's a decision. It's a mental decision and that postures the individuals to position ways that they are not even aware of within themselves to be ready. And I think that when that reality check occurs, that's when I think life becomes more holistic, not just on the personal side, but also on the professional side. Okay, so I'm gonna stop for a second because I'm trying to remember the first time we ever spoke. Show me your ring. You got your ring? There we go. Okay. I'm just checking it. I remember the ring. Okay. So, okay. So fear, control, counterproductivity. All right. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your background is. I don't care if you have 20 degrees and 40 fellowships. You're walking into a room with some extremely powerful people who have tremendous experience. They are used to leadership. They're used to being in control. They are, they don't brock nonsense. You just said it, transparency, being direct. Not everybody wants to deal with confrontation or potential confrontation. Explain to me, I'm a young person, I'm walking into this. How do I cope with all this? If that's not my, you know, I'm, I'm just starting out, okay? So you're, there's a certain level of anxiety, there's a certain level of uncertainty, there's a certain level of concern about how you'll be perceived. How do you deal with that if you want to start out as a leader or becoming a leader in a woman, as a woman, in what ostensibly has been a man's world? Well, I think that it goes back to very basic principles. We are all made of flesh. We all bleed the same way and we all are like, stimulated the same way. That said, um, I think that um, it's important to understand the reason why, why we do what we do. Okay. Um, and that really becomes, I would say, very directly 
uh, related to how, uh, where my strengths are, where my weaknesses are. I was very, I would say intuitive as an individual. I was not afraid to focus on my weaknesses and recognize them and discuss them. But I was also prepared and I was also interested in testing myself. I was not afraid to be tested. I was not afraid to be evaluated. I was not afraid to be, to hear constructive criticism. Now I don't have any particular, I would say, more tolerance for nonsense, but, um, but yes, I am interested in uh, an improvement. And I think that when it comes to, you know, the, one of the questions, why, why are we talking about it now? Most of, most of the time, individuals oftentimes go through a, a journey of professional impact. And then when they get to their 60s and 70s and 80s and retirement, then they talk about all the hurdles, right? <laughs> all the hurdles they've included. And so now they feel comfortable to speak out. I would say that there is some tact and of course wisdom to that and this self-protection. But on the other hand, the opportunity to impact in real time, there are certain coordinates of unique opportunities that will never circle again uh, in this lifetime. And that's really why I have to say that I'm comfortable discussing things as I'm journeying uh, through situations or uh, uh, myself. I think that um, being an individual not affiliated with a large, for instance, platform where it really keeps me close and controls some of my movement, but being independent uh, to be able to go based on the experience, training, uh, wisdom, instinct, um, and having that movement, um, it's, I think, opportunistic and impactful and encouraging. It's one thing to say to somebody, roll up your sleeves and start digging. Completely different thing to say, let's dig together. Let's roll up our sleeves. Ah, there we go. Collaboration. There we go. That's very important. So I'm going to flip this back to what we just said before. Um, I'm a young I'm a young guy, young girl, whatever. We're sitting and having a coffee somewhere and I have an interest, okay? I want to move forward, whether it's academic or organizationally. So again, irrespective of what's happened to you, how do you translate your life experience to them? They, they're thinking about this. Like I said, they're young, they got other obligations and they need the perspective that their time commitment is going to suddenly be you know, there's going to be a physical constraint in their time equipment, time, time perspective, time availability. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so don't convince me, but you're going to mentor me, you're agreeing to collaboration. And I'm, I don't know how many people are going to watch this, but hopefully there's an audience. And maybe some of them have thought about it. Maybe some of them have thought, wouldn't this be really cool to do? Um, above and beyond your experience, how are you going to translate it down to their level as a as a, an initiate? Okay, they're they want to become involved, but it's daunting. Okay, they're dealing with some really high powered people. What's your what's your suggestion? First of all, one has to really understand why they're there, and they have to um, understand it from a comprehensive perspective. What's okay. motivated them to actually take uh, to 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 participate. Okay. They have to also understand uh, what the hurdles are. What are the real obstacles? And three, they have to understand the deliverables. What actually can they achieve? And if you don't visualize it, and if you don't have that vision, you're not going to have, uh, I would say, opportunity to, um, to obtain what you think you might be able to see okay. if you really don't understand with clarity. So um, I'm still, I'm still gonna have to go to the dictionary to read a lot of the words. But let's, let's put this in um, an obvious perspective. Um, most of us, um, most, I can't talk for anybody else, but fear, trepidation, um, you know, a sense of self um, and that sort of thing is not, re doesn't resonate with most people. I mean, not that people don't have the ability to cope and whatnot, but you're going into something of substance. You know, you're, you know, if you looked at the people that were sitting on the board when you delivered that message at Kia, this was not like sort of low, this was high, this was like high energy, really people, tremendously accomplished people, academically research in, in clinical skills. Again, young person, how do they overcome their fear? Not only of failure, but of um, criticism, 
of uh, failure. Okay, how do they overcome their concern that they just won't cut it? Mm -hmm. So I think that um, realizing where deficiencies lie and limitations is a very mature and it's a trait of maturity. Right. And that has to exist. And I think that as humans, we're not perfect, even though we do strive for perfection, but we aren't perfect. So we're in a process of self-evaluation and also, um, um, how do I put this? Um, stressful scenarios that are constructive, that are essentially put through the fire, right? Okay. Uh, gold has to be put through the fire in order to uh, separate the pure from the impure component. So let's, let's go back to what really is the fundamentally important thing to, to remember. The, um, the key thing to recognize is the balance between where the individual is and of course um, where the reality is and that delta that change that the, the differentiating interval if you will is what can perpetuate fear but i'm not afraid of anything i have to say i'm afraid of god but i'm not afraid of anything else so uh, decision in terms of the position of the individual vis-a-vis -vis the experience or vis-a-vis -vis the real-time uh, opportunity it's a decision um, I understand that there are emotions and fear is an emotion and there's temptation to be a fearful. But um, I think there is a either a natural uh, sense of uh, um, maturity or reflection in terms of how one evaluates opportunities. And there's so can be also an acquired component. Oftentimes um, I have to exercise both both vectors of, of improvement, because sometimes I may be naturally gifted in one aspect and, and, and I'm not in the other. So I have to then acquire that particular talent through self-examination, discipline, and of course, uh, self-testing. Otherwise, if I don't self-test myself, the world will test me. It's better yes. for me to know what I made of ahead of time. But nevertheless, there are always opportunities for engagement. And I have to say that I, um, very early on in, in life, and I think that part of the, being a clinician, a scientist, you know, we do sort of, we can self-experiment with, with medical devices or medical protocols, if you will. So puncturing yourself, giving yourself an injection, you know, laser testing things on your skin or whatever yeah. uh, or issue uh, in, in vivo isn't exactly, I would say, something that um, is foreign to clinicians. And so I think that uh, the opportunity for um, for um, the new and the unknown, it is a mark of, um, of combination maturity, at the same time, ability and capacity to appreciate the opportunity and to also envision what the impact is. Uh, I know that there are always exceptions to the rule, but um, if the individual, of course, we're talking about is, let's say, at the start of the career, I, was, I wasn't even at my start of the career when I started, you know, incorporating uh, the policy aspect with the clinical aspect in Washington, D.C. Um, I was, D hadn't even graduated. You know it's Washington, D.C. 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 Right. So I was, um, I launched my career once I graduated University of Michigan final third program at the dental school. And that's when I came officially to Washington DC full time, DC, sorry again. Mm -hmm. And so that said, I think that it's clear. Every individual has a destiny. They have a trajectory. They can say yes or no to it. And sometimes is, um, at times it is more difficult. At times it is easier. But there is a consistency, I would say, in the uh, identification of uh, what the repertoire of talents that individual is made of and what their affinity for the contribution uh, is. And so, um, and here's the other, uh, the other point. I don't think that uh, the, uh, the, um, the measure of value stands in necessarily in the quality or the talent uh, comparison as you know, as is seen by by the world, um, it really is depicted by the intrinsic characteristic of what makes us human. And I think that at the end, when we look really internally, even as a professional, we really know what's valuable and what's not valuable. Okay. So again, in the perspective of somebody who is thinking about doing this, I'm going to ask say two words, three words actually, three words: Saul Silverman. 
mentor. Yes. He was a wonderful, wonderful human being. Um, he, uh, majority of the individuals in our profession have heard of the uh, Saul Silverman protocol. Um, he was a tremendous clinician, incredibly wise, patient, um, very engaging. Uh, key word, key word, patient and engaging. Key words, key words. Okay, go on. Yes. Please. Um, incredibly willing to listen. And um, for those who know me know that sometimes I think outside of the box more than not. Um, and so he would just at times said, okay, um, he used to love, uh, you know, to, to sit down with his students, um, okay. um, all sorts, undergraduate, graduate level. And um, basically I had the privilege and the blessing to be treated, of course, uh, with a great deal of attention, almost like a granddaughter. So, you, uh, you know, you when you, nice. when you have this sort of, um, I would say, um, opportunity to um, experience um, the very raw exchange of the reality of the situation, not have to um, diplomatically present things, not have to speak in riddles at times, but be okay. very direct, be very willing and trusting and you know, I think one of the characteristics of the equivalency of the quality of a board, as well as the individuals on the board, is that interacting balance between wisdom and trust. And so um, Bud Silverman really incorporated that um, within the holistic skill set. And he was one of the actually very first uh, clinicians, oral pathologists, as well as oral medicine clinicians, to incorporate lasers back when it wasn't popular at yeah. all to incorporate uh, lasers in the uh, oral medicine repertoire. And um, I have to say that he also gave me a lot of um, um, important and valuable um, confirmation of instincts that I had as a young uh, professional. And, um, and he also encouraged me, you know, like a father, like a grandfather, uh, to be patient, um, focused. Okay. That's interesting because he sounds like a very gentle soul. And that's why I was asking you the questions nice. before. The a mentor is nurturing. And so if somebody's looking to do this, you also have to be very selective about who you seek out as your mentor. Which brings us to the next question. Okay, what is the bottom line test for testing boards for women to join? So basically, how do you know you're a good fit? If you want to move on, you want to do something on whatever level, again, more corporate, organizational, nonprofit, whatever, mm -hmm. what's, what's your litmus test for whether this makes any sense for you at all? I would say that at uh, the moment, uh, my uh, go-to uh, test would be a three-month deliverable. If in three months I am allowed the freedom to exercise one project contribution okay. in a potential that will have some worthy deliverables, I would say that that board is certainly something that uh, is, um, has a potential to be, to be valuable in the future, um, longitudinal future. The okay. other is um, essentially reward. And I strongly recommend for women to negotiate and to expect um, uh, paid board positions as opposed to non-paid board positions. Um, okay. The one thing, for instance, with um, um, with Bud Silverman, uh, Saul Silverman, uh, Bud is, is how his friends and some very close colleagues have known him. I had met him on, when I was acting on the American Academy of Oral Medicine Board of Trustees. And so he took me under sort of, as I said, like a parental grand, grandparent type so of cool. uh, type of of protective, if you will. He saw the value of what I um, could contribute and what the Academy needed. And there were many great people um, with him on the board who also saw the same thing. However, there's always a, um, a fear factor, both on an individual side that is a temptation for, as well as on the corporate side in terms of the direction and um, 
So those aspects, I think the fear factors, even though I don't necessarily subscribe to it, you have to recognize it in the premise of the reality um, you know, of, of, of what's happening. And you have to help individuals or the corporation or the entity or the uh, collegiate effort uh, to identify it. And so um, I think as clinicians, we don't do very well therapeutically if we don't face the abnormality. And so we're very, I think, um, comfortable with that approach. Okay, so can I, and this is, I have to be very careful how I ask these questions. I, I, I don't want it to sound uh, confrontational. Why did you never pursue your PhD? You've got papers, you've got this, you've got that, you're literally everywhere. Is that a North American thing? People in North America don't, like they don't value it. I mean, unless you're in like hardcore academia, is that part of it? Well, I have to say that um, I was more, I was really interested in the subject matter. Okay. Uh, the degrees for me is just the cherry on top of the ice cream. I okay. think that there might be some coming honorary degrees in the future by invitation, but uh, which I didn't plan for. But let's face it again, I had already been in school for 10 years. Practically, I paid for tenure, right? <laughs> At the university. Okay. <laughs> That's the way I think about it. And um, here's the other thing. I deferred law school. So if I really was going to go with instinct and in what I actually do, but I don't necessarily discuss it as much, which is innovation and looking at intellectual property um, protection of protocols for the purpose of having timed and idealized timed for innovations and protocols hit the market, not only hit the market, but penetrate effectively, because that's what we want for our patients. And we know we are facing um, for the past, I would say decade or two, a collective or trophies innovations that really sit on the shelf and they're not being utilized. And okay. yet the consumers are in dire need of those particular uh, um, uh, solutions and yet they don't have access to them. So that said, I could have pursued, you know, the, the, the law school option um, and it would be very close to my heart. But um, after three degrees, I would say that um, the fact that the subject matter was key and the toxicology component, even though it was not understood by <laughs> maturity, 99% of my colleagues in dentistry did not understand why toxicology. They, they, they immediately went through to the, uh, the quick assessment of uh, amalgam toxicity and, uh, you know, and, and, and metal uh, reaction. But that's not nowhere near really what toxicology actually does for me as a clinician. It gives incredible insight into understanding the deficiencies in the systemic host response. Um, one can understand at the in vitro level as well as the in vivo level, looking from a medical device perspective, interaction, uh, as well as looking from a clinical protocols perspective. So understanding how things fail really gives you very pinpointed and comprehensive solutions. That's the key. You know, fear of failure is irrelevant. You know, best to fail. Well, what was Einstein? Uh, Einstein what was Edison's thing? I successfully failed 10,000 times. It's all good. <laughs> so um, there was an agenda here in doing this that I probably didn't discuss. Well, I didn't discuss it with you. And the agenda was you're about to launch a journal. Yes. Right. So good um, launch pad for a lot of people, young women, young men, whatever, to find out how to publish. You're obviously, uh, you're, you're inordinately intelligent and you're normally committed. So I'm going to ask you, uh, are you willing to mentor people? If people watch this and pick this up, they'll have your email, info, is it info at DC Laser something? Actually, I have another email for that. It's more, it's, um author at claudiasicotka.com but yes you asked about okay mentorship. okay so well, the post, when the post goes all your emails will go on there so you're going to get bombarded you'll have to <laughs> add 12 hours to your day so but okay. again you were the, the point of this the agenda was to establish um i knew saul silverman the history of it not totally what he was involved with but you know word of mouth word on the street right when you so the the twisting of the arm right now is with the journal and whatnot, you'll open yourself up to mentoring anybody that comes your way, right? So, certainly. Well, here's the other thing, Ken. I've actually been doing that from global inquiries for the past 17, 18 years in Washington, really? D.C. In D.C. DC. Um, as you said, D.C. You, you, I, I want to no, make sure I'm, I'm uh, respectful. Much. 
um, but uh, yes, so I have done that. And I have to say that um, because that has been just a continued request and I've always wanted to make myself available, whether it's a, um, a student inquiry or whether it's a more seasoned professional or even a collaboration from a, a senior uh, um, a senior expert. Um, I um, so that really gave birth to actually another project which we're not talking about today, but it's called yeah. the Global Leadership in Dentistry and Sciences, and that actually has been launched about uh, from last year officially. Uh, we actually are in. Um, almost 70 countries. We have an ambassador in every country. And essentially um, by uh, middle of uh, or late this year, we will um, have of course a presence globally in all 194 countries. The premise of that particular uh, platform is essentially to make accessible what I've been having the opportunity to do here in DC from a 360 healthcare participation as a clinician in all the different subsectors to hone leadership skills to um, healthcare experts. And of course, we started with dentistry because uh, we are dentists, but it is by no means uh, exclusive to dentists and it's open to other healthcare experts and, and uh, clinicians. And so um, that's, uh, we, we weren't planning on speaking about that, but that is, for instance, the opportunity. Uh, that's a segue for the next time. We'll do it next time. Yeah. So I, I exactly. do have one last question. One last question. When was the last time you went to a club and went dancing? Aha, uh -huh. gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I'm just being silly. Okay, so so, so let me uh, let me just add for um, to follow up on your question earlier the journal. So the journal, yes, it is a launching pad, a springboard. Um, first issue will be launched in 2022 in August, um, but it is essentially reflective of 20 plus years of data and um, uh, tried and proven concepts. Um, and uh, formidable results in laser microsurgery. Okay, so it's lasers. The, the, yes. the point of this as well, I mean, the, you're the underlying factors, obviously, your laser institute. The fellow that I just interviewed was uh, Giovanni Olivi. It's all yes. about lasers and endo, lasers and perio, lasers and oral surgery. So it's very interesting what he's doing. So there's a continuum there. And the point is, I'll introduce you to him and maybe something will come of it. Who knows? They'll get involved. That's the beauty of doing this. It's connecting the dots. It's so much fun. Mm -hmm. Until next time. Until next time. Going to go to. We'll have to go. I don't know where you are at any moment in time. It'll be so much fun just to go out to dinner, and just chat. I mean, not this formal stuff, but it would be just all kinds of fun. So, Claudia, thank you again. And uh, once this drops, we'll talk about. I had no idea the scope of this, what's back in this journal. That's extraordinary. Okay. All of this, you know, 195 countries. Are there 195 countries in the world? Is that when I, the Arctic? Well, in Antarctica? As, as, there are more actually, but this is the sanctioned, <laughs> the, the sanctioned recognition by the, by, by, by the leadership. Okay. Sounds good. All right. So see you soon. Okay. We will see you soon. It was lovely talking to you. I'm on my way to find the dictionary. And I appreciate it. You have a wonderful day. You got patience now, right? Don't you have a patience? Yes, I do. I do. Oh. And I have to say that we actually, the global leadership uh, for dentistry and, and sciences are actually, uh, is on LinkedIn. So you can follow it there and you can get uh, accessibility to actually real-time projects. Um, if okay. you're looking for mentorships or contributions, et cetera, just for those who are interested. So say that slowly again, global. Global leadership, dentistry and sciences. Global Leadership Dentistry and Scientists, and you have a Facebook page. Yes, but we are really on LinkedIn because, again, okay, it's for LinkedIn. professional reasons, leadership, that's the platform that really merits. Uh, and so individuals who part participate in those projects essentially get to exercise in writing um, press releases. Uh, they engage in executive summaries of projects as well as implementation. Uh, they can bring their own project to the platform, or of course we will find a opportunity for them to engage. And so we essentially make accessible the challenge Keyword. of the challenge, right? Of, um, of, a, uh, of running uh, with the leaders uh, at the C-level um, um, status, um, either CFO or CEO, et cetera. Um, and you really get to roll up your sleeves and start executing. So. Um, that, of course, gives access to uh, that uh, experience, which is, I think, is the most valuable. And few platforms actually 
uh, give that opportunity. How do you find this? Okay, so forget the fact that, um, okay, so it's not, it's avoid Facebook, go to LinkedIn. So global. Global leadership. Have to do it slowly. I'm very old. Global leadership. <laughs> then. <laughs> um, you're very wise though, I'm sure. I know that. Uh, global leadership, dentistry, global and leadership. sciences. Global leadership, dentistry. So I'm going to go to LinkedIn and look for global leadership, dentistry, and scientists. How do I find that? Hashtag, whatever? Um, actually, if you just type in global leadership, dentistry, ampersand sciences, you'll be able to find it. You can also find my profile as well, Claudia Sikotka, okay. and the page also will populate under my reference. There you go. Now everybody knows how to find it, and we'll see how it goes. All right. So thank you. Again, the dictionary is now open. I'll figure it all out. And we'll see you next time and talk about this journal because the journal sounds very interesting. You know, yes, really intrigued. I mean, I would imagine it would apply to people from the FDI. Is that correct? I mean, all these people that are European, American uh, educational committees for deans and uh, dental education. And um, what's the one at Harvard? There's a big one at Harvard that directs people to executive leadership. That sort of yes. thing, 12 month program. So mm -hmm. now they have a place to publish. Not that they didn't, but now they have an even more focused place to publish. All right. Thank you so much as always, Claudia. Go and look after your patient. It's about time you actually went to work and made some money. Go, go make some money. Okay, talk to you soon. Okay, all right, take care. See you next Bye. time. Next time, absolutely.